Welcome to the Bet on Me podcast, the ultimate resource for softball players looking to take control of their training and reach their full potential. I'm your host, Krista Stoker, and on this show, we'll be discussing everything from taking a holistic approach to your training to data driven strategies for maximizing and growing yourself not only on the field, but off. At S2 Breakthrough, we believe that athletes should lead their own journey and push past any perceived ceilings on their talent. So join us as we explore the world of softball player development and help you bet on yourself. Because when you bet on yourself, you can't lose. All right, super pumped today to be with the famous Joey Lai. Um, So we obviously had the opportunity um, to meet and work with Joey in 2020, which was a very crazy time for all. Um, and now it seems so crazy that it's uh, seemingly been so short since we've known you, but it feels like a lifetime. So maybe if you can just tell everyone um, a very summed up version, because I feel like your background could get quite long, but maybe uh, a little summary of sort of where you've been in softball and sort of where you are for now. Sure. Um, I grew up in that. Toronto and was recruited to play ice hockey and softball at Williams College, Division Three in Massachusetts. And uh, when I graduated, I joined the coaching staff for both sports and also tried out for the Canadian national team, got cut, went back a year later, ended up making the roster and played uh, on the team from 2010 through 2021 and the, you know, concluded my career at the Tokyo Olympics with Canada's first ever medal in softball. So that was really exciting. And all the while, up until the pandemic, continued to coach and uh, yeah, was able to drop into S2 during the pandemic when I stepped away from coaching and full-time trained. And that was such an amazing time in my career. And I can't wait to dive into more of that. Yeah. I remember that time period was very crazy, obviously for all of us and trying to navigate coaching and playing through the pandemic. And uh, it was the very first season of Athletes Unlimited. And we were at the time working with Williams and, and Chris said to us, like I, I, there's someone you have to meet. Like, I just feel like you guys are going to really hit it off. And I think at the time we didn't, ex- we just thought we were meeting a great person. So I don't know if we fully understood uh, what she was sort of uh, inner, like starting us for. I don't know if it was like meant to be an interview or anyways, but it was hard even at that time for you to get to S2 because there were so many sort of obstacles in the way with the pandemic and what we had to do and the environments that we had to be in. Um, but maybe from your perspective first, what did you think you were coming to S2 for at that time? Or what did Chris, uh, because we lovingly, I assume Chris listens to this on 1.5 speed. So hopefully she picks up what I'm saying, but, uh, I, uh, we all, I always feel like Chris like tricks us into great friendships and, uh, things, but what did you think you were first coming to S2? Yeah, I think very similar to you. I just thought, oh, awesome. I'm going to meet some amazing people in softball. I didn't really, I mean, I spent probably two hours on the phone with Ashley before I came in. So I had an idea of what you all were doing there, but really stepping into your space and getting to sit down with all of you and get that full picture really just blew my mind what you had created there. And uh, at the end of that conversation that afternoon, when the the two of you were like, so uh, you should come train here. Uh (laughs) was was a big <laughs> shock because it, it was just not what I was expecting to come from that relationship. And I'm so grateful that it did. And it just, it opened my eyes in a whole new way and created so many opportunities for me as an athlete and now can carry so much of that into my life. Yeah. Okay. So I, from my perspective, there were kind of two phases where you worked with us. The first was that very early phase. So we decided you decided we were like, you should come train with us. And they were like, yeah, I should. Uh, And then you moved here for two and a half weeks. I think that first time was um, something along that lines and trained every day for hours at S2, um, sort of lived in our space. And so that I feel like is phase one. So maybe walk through what led you to finally, you know, make the decision. So you had just met us, but to come train with us and what your goals out of that first round of training were, what you were like hoping to achieve in your career at that point. Um, and then I feel like there was for sure. Yeah. I think during the pandemic, it, it was a challenge, right? We were all trying to figure out the Olympics were delayed it, you know, all, all these unknowns for everybody in all areas of our lives. And so for me personally, it was, okay, I've now stepped away from my job. What am I going to do? The opportunity to play in athletes unlimited was amazing. 
but then what, you know, am I just going to go back home and try to figure it out, train in my friend's basement and try to find, you know, driving an hour to a softball facility. And so saying yes for me to come out to S2 was not hard. And, um, it, it just, I don't, I'm not sure what I really expected, what I, if I even really knew what I was getting into, but just that opportunity to be an athlete and to discover more about myself every single day from day one, the passive movement screen to the dynamic movement screen to the, the sensors and understanding what my body was actually doing through my swing. And it was just every day I was learning something new and being an athlete full time is so different than being an athlete on the side. And so as we all know, as female athletes, we rarely get that opportunity. It's tough to make a living to, in order to do that. And uh, so making that decision to, to dive in was something I, I never would have done had the pandemic not hit. And so I think walking into that first phase, it was kind of, I was an open book. I, I'm not really sure what I'm getting into. I know I'm going to learn a, a bit about myself and, but it was just, it was mind blowing after those first few weeks of working with you every single day and really waking up every day as an athlete to learn more about myself and to essentially gain more power in my own training. And I felt like after that first phase, I really walked away understanding that my ceiling was so much higher than I ever knew. And I had less than a year to get as good as I could possibly get in order to hopefully make that Olympic roster. Yeah. I think when we were getting ready to jump on to record, I was saying, you know, the theme I feel like of this conversation is really this bet on me mantra. We use it a lot. And to me, sort of the decisions you made really, uh, they, like that's such a good mantra for you, which is uh, sort of late in the career, <laughs> making sort of a risky move um, to bet on yourself and just try to get better and that time period for me felt like uh, we had a lot of time because it was the pandemic. And so we would, we would come early before our you know younger athletes would come in and just uh, you trained a long time. You were at SU for a long time with breaks and stuff for your lift and that type of thing. But um, to really, I felt like I was just like, let's just educate. So you have tools because it really was a short time period in the grand scheme of things. So it wasn't like, this is going to be the time we have all the breakthroughs, but it was being able to send you into an environment where you had, more information. I remember even from the start, you know, we have this assessment process and we have a very wide span of athletes that have done the assessment process. So we have athletes that clear it and they green light everything and their story is very specific and that type of thing. And then a lot of our high school athletes don't come close to clearing it because they're high schoolers. And so it's your story is like, keep going. And I remember your story was so specific and, and almost like so clear. And I feel like that's why it felt like like um, we always say sometimes our storytelling part is like an aha moment for the athlete. And even for me, because there was like just a couple things that we were targeting. And obviously Carly was super impactful in that. Um, and so it felt like we could like tap into things maybe quicker than you were able to in the past. So maybe talk a little bit about, you know, because one of the biggest things I think athletes, uh, you know, don't do or don't have the opportunity to do is this like integrated approach. So maybe walk through the how it was for you since you lived here and we trained a lot uh, to work with, you know, going from like Carly and obviously you had your Team Canada strength program that you were also following. And then, this, you know, we're hitting with me and sort of what that overarching. Yeah. I've felt never like been you. in a space and maybe never will again, where all of the pieces just fit so well. And all of you who work there are so empowering and play off of each other and communicate well with one another. And it's a well-oiled machine in that way and more so empowers us as athletes to be able to excel in all areas. So having Carly able to observe and give feedback to my Team Canada lifting program to develop a, my body specific warm up for uh, for the other things that I was doing obviously alongside you with regard to hitting and figuring out what how my body was best primed to do its work and even make an adjust, making an adjustment from one day to the next of, okay, when you lift first and go right into hitting, you, you stink. So let's figure out how to better plan our day. And on days what, that we're doing a heavy, a heavy lift, it'll always have to be after hitting so we can get the most out of our hitting sessions and just little, little tweaks like that, that are simple 
and mm-hmm. we might never realize them or be able to make those adjustments. Um, and you know, the, the, the mind that Carly has inside of that skull of hers is just, it blows my mind, uh, you know, getting into the cage and having just a, a tiny ailment in a hip and stepping out and Carly giving me a couple of cues, doing a couple of movements and stepping back into the cage and being able to feel awesome and swing freely and get so much out of that session. If, if I wasn't in that integrated performance training environment, I wouldn't have been able to do that. I would have struggled through my hitting session, feeling that um, discomfort and never kind of coming out the other side, feeling like I had a really productive, great session. So it's just, I can't say enough for how you all set up your, your system and just empower your athletes to get the most out of every area. Yeah. I think obviously another theme that came up in what you said, and then we talked about this all the time when you were here was, um, that unfortunately female athletes don't get the opportunity very often at your stage in their career to have the resources like this. So, you know, it's interesting for us because we would love to offer this to, you know, professional softball players all the time, but it's just very hard with the limitations and the parameters. So I think it was, you know, in some ways the pandemic offered some ability for us to unite and be able to, to provide that opportunity. But some of the things that we are most inspired by with integration and player development and tech and all of these things uh, come from the baseball space. And, and unfortunately, some of our higher level athletes in our game, it's really tricky to have opportunities like you did to, to access things like this. So I think it's important and maybe talk about uh, some of your experiences with your Team Canada teammates, but even what you were just saying of like, it was either train in my friend's basement <laughs> or, uh, you know, find this space. And I think also for you, you had to leave your job to be able to train like this, which I think is something obviously a massive sacrifice. It's not like you were leaving your job because team Canada was paying you millions of dollars to play for the Olympics. So maybe just walk through your experience because you, you have been sort of a professional athlete for a while. Um, and what that felt like as a female athlete, trying to train for the stage as big as the Olympics with sort of maybe limited resources or, or that type of what that felt like for your teammates. Yeah, and I think a lot of, that. a lot of my teammates had walked away from jobs or, you know, chosen different paths so that they could have more time to train. And, um, I hate the word sacrifice, but essentially sacrificed a lot of things. Um, I prefer, I choose to look at it as we, that we had an opportunity to train for the Olympics and, and that's the, the mentality that right. you know, helped me get up every morning with a kick in my step. Um, but a lot of people gave up a lot of things, yeah. time with family, jobs, um, school, people took time off school and, uh, we all just did it because we wanted, we had a childhood dream and we had an opportunity to make history for our country. And the, the fact that we weren't gaining a sustainable income by playing softball was, it was a non-factor in, in that moment. Um, you know, now softball goes into a phase where we're not officially on the Olympic program. And so players are going back to their jobs. They're going back to school. They're going back to all those things. And again, having less time to dedicate to training still now understanding for a lot of those returning athletes, the level they were able to put into their training um, and having to be okay with not doing that. So I think the, the ebbs and flows of softball are largely, uh, dictated by if it's on the Olympic program. And so it's, it's frustrating that it's not. Mm -hmm. And so those athletes have to take a step back again. But I think for me in that moment, deciding to be a full-time athlete, it, when I really looked at myself and my soul, it was a no brainer. It, it was a a dream I'd have had my whole life. And despite having to give up a a, a nice paycheck, it, every other light was green with regard to that decision. And obviously having a wife and a family who would support me through that, if, if I were to need anything was, was helpful, but it's, it's a big choice as a female athlete to fully dive into dive in head first as an athlete and just try to figure everything out on the side. So I'm, I'm grateful I landed with you. Yeah. I think too, it's important to clarify for people. So you made this decision and you make it sound so sure, um, but maybe clarify for the listeners. <laughs> did you know that you were on the Olympic team when you tra- started training with S2? So, 
decided to step away from my head <laughs> yeah. division one head coaching job to train full time with the hope yeah. that I would be one of the 15 names to the roster. And that, I mean, stepping into your environment, again, I didn't really know what I was getting into, but every day I became more empowered to do what I was doing and more confident in what I was doing and more confident as an athlete. And we didn't focus a whole lot on defense. I did my own kind of defense work on the side, but even the defense side of my game got better because I, as an athlete and as a human was more confident in everything that I was doing. When I walked back into training camp in January of 2021, every part of my game, my teammates were like, holy shit, Joey Lie. Like, what have you been up to? Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of that is a testament to just being surrounded by amazing role models who are pushing, who are pushing me to fully embrace my own journey and take control of my own journey. Yeah, for sure. I think just like so many people, like you think, okay, here comes, you know, someone that's played a long time and, and has experienced a lot of different training, has access to things. And I, I think one of the things for me is that one of the things the game does not maybe intentionally, but what happens in the game a lot and the, the stories that athletes that come to us have told themselves, which is like, I am this person. I am this person. Like, this is who I am. This is all over being. I would describe it as like someone has told you and you have believed that there's like a ceiling to your abilities. And so I remember when you came, like, I'm sure you were like, wow, this lady, just like chill out. But you were like, I bunt and fast. And I was like, well, that, I mean, that can't be all you do. So we have to also, you have to hit. Why can't you hit? You barely you almost cleared our assessment. Like, what are you talking about? So I think just also a lot of those few weeks initially were spent just like breaking down some perceived uh, ceilings that you had built up over your career of like, you know, this is just who I am as a player. It's like, yeah, but you could be that and this and that, and you could sort of like add to your game that same point. So I think sometimes like, yes, the training is good. And we were very immersed in the environment for a few weeks, but it also was just a matter of like, we have seen people break out of those a lot. And so we felt very confident that we could, you know, add more elements, more dimension to what you yes. were like going back very, to Team Canada with. Um, so what yeah, was that I experience say, I'm yeah, very grateful like for you? That I I quickly gained full trust in everything that you were doing and just went all out. And I still will go back and look at my side-by-side -side video of my swing from like day one of hitting work to three weeks later and how different it was, how much of an impact just the attention to detail and specific to me warmups, specific to me training, specific to me drills, uh, how much impact that had on my ability to put power into the ball. Um, so I don't even remember the question that you just asked me, but <laughs> I'm yeah. yeah, so, so grateful for that, that yeah. buy in and that all of you, I could tell that all of you were all in on me from the minute I walked in that door. Yeah. I was thinking as you were, as we are like reflecting, I'm like, wow, I don't remember feeling a lot of pressure, but this actually feels really stressful that, that we didn't know if you're going to make the team. And we were like, okay, we got two weeks, let's figure it out. Let's go for it. But I, it didn't feel like that at the time, because I think we all obviously loved you so much and just like saw how dedicated you were to being an athlete. And you basically became also like a member of the SU staff for three weeks and fully immersed in our family. So it just felt like we were just kind of side by side. Um, and obviously had a lot of confidence because of how much you were uh, investing in. So let's go to then. Okay. So I think I remember the timeline, right? Let's see. You left S2, then you went and it was like the trial period, right? So you went back to camp with Team Canada over break. And it was like the determining who got on the roster. And as we already know from the beginning of this podcast, you made the roster. So yeah. Um, and then we had, I think, two more weeks. Like you came back for like two weeks before you went into camp. And so I guess what was that time period like for you? We were sort of checking in and making sure you were ready. Um, and then you knew sort of once you went that then it was like, you know, all Team Canada up into the Olympics after that. So what was sort of phase two for you? Now you know you're on the team. So we're sort of like our mind shift has shifted a little bit. Um, and so what was that yeah. sort of time period like for you? How did it shift? I guess how you approached it, maybe thinking like, Okay, I'm trying to make the team. Yeah, so they, the team they continued to keep us on the edge of our seat because they didn't name who was going to be the alternates. 
until May. So it, there was still right. a little bit of okay, that yeah. of right. like needing to prove myself in order to make that final, final 15. But I think then coming back, like being able to go to camp and getting the feedback from my coaches and my teammates who hadn't seen me since I'd started working with S2 was, was really cool feedback for me. I knew I was better, but just to know that they also saw it uh, was an, another layer of the comp- confidence boost and that, yes, I'm on the right track. And now I can continue to fully dive in and, and mer- immerse myself in this training, knowing that they too see it. Um, because obviously at the end of the day, the coach is the one who names the roster. Right. And if they're not seeing the, the changes or the improvements, right. or they don't have confidence in you, then um, then I'm going to have less confidence in what I'm doing. So knowing that I had made the next level and um, and that it was translating in their eyes too, I think allowed me just that extra layer of confidence in what I was doing. And um yeah, it was fun to be able to come back and and be like, yes, okay, we've checked that off. Now, okay, now the the goal is just that that tiny little, you know, make make the tiny goal of making that final roster and uh, continuing on the path we were on. But so, yeah, I think overall, the- yeah, I think that focus our focus shifted more to like preparing for the Olympics. So I remember we started doing like the goal became like hit Monica Abbott. No offense to USA, but I was at this moment cheering for Team Canada. So, um, so we were like recreating the machine and I was trying to, you know, there's data out there on what they throw. So we were recreating the type of spin they had and making sure that we were prepped for what you were going to see at the Olympics, which obviously was not, uh, you know, 55 miles per hour off the machine. It was 72 coming from a six foot two person who strides so that she lands 34 feet from you. So we were really trying to recreate a lot of that. So that training environment, I I think some of the relief of knowing we weren't trying to, it was less about change at that point, although it was still trying to optimize you, but more about like, what are the types of environments we need to be in to prep to hit against some of these really, really good pitchers um, who also (laughs) happen to get really, really big zones in the Olympics, which we uh, learned. So um, that to me was sort of the shift, which I think in the, for all the challenges that we already mentioned, female athletes don't always get the benefit of that type of work, um, which is, you know, obviously disappointing for the growth of our game. So we hope that some of our female athletes can continue to make enough money <laughs> that they can really train and, and sort of maximize themselves. But that's what it felt like for me as we were like, okay, let's keep optimizing. Let's stay pain free. Let's do all of these things. And then let's also prep for the Olympics, which is what we're going to. So I think that was actually, I think that was like really, it was fun. It was a little less pressure, not less pressure because you wanted to perform, but it was like more uh, of the yes, fun. Yes, a little more of talk of strategy and actually executing on pitches versus focusing right. on my mechanics. Obviously there's still drills and stuff to hit those habits home, but yeah, j- the, the details of the game, we got to focus on a little bit more. Right. Then I think the last thing that would be interesting for people to hear is because obviously then you went to camp and, and any environment like that is more of a, it's a team environment, right? So, you know, it is the most individualized coach in the world. At the end of the day, you still have to approach it in, as a team and the whole team is there. And so what was that? Obviously we stayed in touch and we sort of navigated some of that too, but what was the experience like once you got in more team dynamic and, and how did you sort of navigate, like, how do I pull some of my individual stuff that I need, but then I'm following sort of the team practice and that type, what was that experience like? And whether maybe some like tips or something yeah, that you were I able to navigate that. Just the whole idea um, of advocating yeah. for what you need and allowing yourself taking ownership of it. And if you need more time to warm up, making sure that you do that. And if there's no time at the field doing stuff at home or where at the hotel or whatever it is before before going. So I think it became a running joke that, you know, Joey needs half an hour for a warm up and <laughs> Yeah, you have to talk about your bat. Yeah. So around. working in those extra warm up pieces for me outside of the team warm up. Um, making sure to work in, have time for my plyos. So often, you know, even if I showed up late to the throwing, um by a minute because I was finishing my plyos, I would make sure to do that because I knew how important they were for me. And the, the bat of course 
the heavy the heavy bat um, with a, basically a roll of duct tape rolled around the <laughs> the end of it. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel Nicolaisen, if he's listening to this. I was like, how do we create a wood a heavy bat without having to buy one? He's like, put duct tape on it. It, did look it works, crazy. but it looks crazy. It's like. <laughs> Here comes a member of Team Canada with her duct tape. To yes. Bed. And so, again, I knew I was going to get yeah. poked fun at for that, pulling that out of my bag on a, a daily basis. Um, but just making sure I knew and felt confident that it was helping me and preparing me and working for me. And so making sure to do that. Um, the, you know, my, my strap. What's the strap called again? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Unless so hooking strapped. that up, finding a it's light just, pole yeah. to hook that up to, or the fence at, at the field and, you know, using that to prep prime my body in the way that we had talked about and figured out that worked best for me. And, you know, then a couple of my teammates were like, Oh, that looks cool. Like, can I try it? Absolutely. So then, you know, bringing some of that stuff into, into their preparation too, but just really advice for other people is know what you need and take ownership of what you need and take ownership of your journey and figure out how to fit in the things that you need to fit in without taking away from your team practices. Yeah. And I would, uh, highly, I would, I would venture, I would put, um, I think I would put my life on it that your teammates think you're a pretty good teammate. Um, and so I think too, for coaches, from my perspective, I would say like coaches, don't be afraid of players who are advocating for themselves because you can, you can do both. You can, you know, do the things you need for, to continue to improve yourself. And, and players are trying to improve themselves for the team. So you can do the things the players can individually do what they need and still be good teammates fit within the, the team practice, you know, do those types of things. So I think from the coach's perspective, from the player's perspective, learn to advocate, do it respectfully, you know, find ways to, to navigate that. And from the coach's perspective, don't be afraid of athletes doing that because like if at the end of the day you took away the fact that people were asking you to do something different and you were just like, do you want an athlete who's doing everything possible to be the best version of herself? Obviously coaches say yes to that. So I think you just have to sort of navigate that. But yeah, I think for players to understand that you carried like a duct tape bat, different straps, went early to do things. You know, I think sometimes you and I, you message when you have like hip stuff flaring up or different things. So we had to like add in different things that you had to, fit in wherever. And so I think like that does require a lot of, uh, you have to really be committed to that and, and advocate for yourself. But I would <laughs> 100%. <laughs> yes. And I think in a lot of what I do now, just trying to help athletes and people in general, understand that you can bet on yourself. And when you do bet on yourself, figure out what you need in order to be the most successful version of yourself. And people want to help people do great things. So the more you kind of share those goals with other people and just like get the people who are in your corner to understand what you're trying to do, they're going to support you through that. So I think that's another reason why it fit with my team is that they knew I was working hard to be the best version of myself for them. And they supported me and loved every minute of it just as much as I did because it was ultimately for them too. Yeah. That is a, an awesome place. And I think the very last question I want to ask, and maybe we'll just keep it maybe short, like one sentence of what did it feel like to play in the Olympics? Sum it up in one sentence. There's your test. To play in the Olympics, it was like a dream you would never imagine. Got the tattoo. So I have to, I have to remind myself, like I look at right. that every day to remind myself that it was not a dream. And Stepping up onto that podium with my teammates is a feeling that I will never in my life forget. Yeah, you deserved it. We were all rooting for you. And I think we we obviously saw all of the work and dedication that you put into it. And so it was, uh, you had a fan club, although the games were at absurd hours. We really tried to watch you play at 2 a.m. Um, and so it was so fun to root you on. So thank you very much. We obviously, I could talk, uh, with you forever but we'll kind of leave it there um, and hopefully people are inspired by your story we certainly were um, and we awesome. are excited Thank to keep reading so much. on I what you do next you and all of you at S2 now and forever well S2 Nation thanks for joining another episode of the Bet On Me podcast go out today 
bet on yourself, and remember, when you bet on yourself, you can't lose.